If you would, take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy in chapter 4 this morning. Paul is writing to the young Timothy concerning his life in the ministry. He begins the first epistle to Timothy, 1 Timothy, with these words. And of course he gives the introduction but he says in beginning in verse 4 of 1 Timothy in chapter 1, or 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, he says, And I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. As we come to 2 Timothy, we understand that Paul, in Paul's day, that there was a great fallacy that was taking place in the New Testament church. Some have called it the great dragnet of the New Testament church that had gone out and had reaped the harvest. Some who were sincere believers and others who would, uh, uh, who would soon fall away. And if they didn't fall away, that they would bring, an errant, or bring errancy into, or heresy and errancy into the local church. As believers, we are called to stand firm in the faith and to practice sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, we're going to begin reading in verse 1, and we're going to read down through verse 8, if you would. Read with me. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall, heap to shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of, the, of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at, the day, at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we pray as the Apostle John prayed, even so come. Lord Jesus, we know that you have given us a, a warning, that you've given us a revelation, that you are coming and you're coming soon. And Lord, I pray that we might be prepared, that each and every heart might be ready. And Lord, for everyone who professes Christ, that they be found diligently working for the cause of the gospel. Lord, that they stand firm in their faith, that they practice sound doctrine. Lord, that they do the work of an evangelist until you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Alexander McLaren says in his commentary that verses 1 through 5 are a rousing appeal to Timothy to fulfill his ministry. And he says embedded in it, there's a sad prophecy of coming days, of the coming days for the church, which constitutes not a reason for despondency or for abandoning the work, but for doing it with all one's might. For doing it with all one's might. Now I want to admit to you this morning, as I go through the message this morning, and I hope that none of you are grading me on a a theological, uh, pers uh, from a theological perspective, it is sound theologically, it is sound doctrinally. The uh, construction of it is atrocious. And so if I were to go and to present a message like I'm going to present to you this morning before a seminary professor, that he would probably say, listen, get your act together, guy. But I want to point out several facts that the Apostle Paul points out to Timothy in regards to the audience of which we are called to minister to. As Southern Baptists, as believers in Christ, 
we are called to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. We've got to know what to expect. One of the most notable aspects of Paul's ministry was his commitment to hard work and to sacrifice. He worked very hard. And, and he recognized that the hard work in which he accomplished, he attributed it to the grace of God. If you go back and turn to 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 and verse 10, we see where Paul says it was by the grace of God. But I want you to focus in on verse 6 of 1 Timothy in chapter 4. He says, the King James Version says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. That, those words, that phrase, ready to be offered in the, Greek, or in the Greek, it is actually one word. That one word in the Greek is spindo. Spindo. As a primary verb, it literally means to pour out. To pour out. Both the English Standard Version and the New American Standard Bible, the, the 1995 version, puts it this way. That same verse. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. The Apostle Paul recognized that, listen, his death was imminent. But he also re made a reference back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. Of which the drink offering was the final offering that would follow the burnt offering and the grain offering prescribed for the people of Israel. For the children of Israel as they offered up sacrifices to the Lord. Paul was not saying, listen, I'm spent. In December of 2019, there was a young man by the name of uh, Jonathan Master who wrote an article. And the title of the article was, Poured Out, Not Burnt Out. And this, in this article, he relates to the audience how we are to invest ourselves com wholeheartedly, total commitment to the cause of Christ all of the days of our life. So what are we to expect in this life? Listen, I've had a lot of disappointments. I'm just going to be honest with you. As a pastor, as a preacher, as a Christian, I've experienced a lot of disappointments and you know where those disappointments came from? People. People. I've, I've met with all kinds of excuses. I've heard all kinds of reasons. I've, met, I've seen all kinds of opposition in regards to the gospel. And I'm sure that many of you who have been a child of God for years and you've tried to witness to folks, you've experienced the same thing. Paul tells Timothy, listen, it's going to be common practice in the church to come. And you know what? We are in the church to come. So what does that mean for us? We cannot, listen, though we become disappointed in people, we cannot quit. What Paul tells Timothy is, listen, you've got to know your audience. You've got to know your audience. Look with me in verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Remember I made the reference to how some refer to the great dragnet of the, the gospel, the great dragnet of the church, how it goes out and embraces many and pulls many into the church and yet there will be some who are insincere in their in their faith in their belief and in their practice who will be drawn in and ultimately they will either turn away from their faith they will renounce their faith and I, I was reading an interesting article this last week where it was talking about evangel evangelizing children evangelizing children you know in southern baptist circles we were renowned for inviting children 
to come forward and simply to repeat a prayer after me and to ask Jesus into their heart. And children take things very simply. They take things very literally. And so when we were inviting them to ask Jesus into their heart, we were failing to tell them that Jesus can't come into the heart that's darkened with sin and that you need to understand that you are a sinner and that in you is no life. Therefore, we must confess that fact and repent of that sin before the Holy Spirit and Jesus, of Jesus Christ can come and indwell us. Paul tells Timothy that his audience is going to be full of selfish desire. And remember I said that the structure of this message this morning is atrocious if you were to present it to a seminary professor. But I want to point out at this in verse Three, the second part, the latter part of verse 3 of 2 Timothy. And that word but is a pivotal word. Paul has, has informed Timothy in the first part, for the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine. That's a fact. That's a fact. We're going to get to that a little bit later on. But, and Paul begins to lay out the argument in his presentation to Timothy as to the, what they will do. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Do you know why the prosperity gospel is so prominent in society today? Because people want to hear something Pleasant. They don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear about hell. They simply want to hear that if you'll just plant your seed, God will bless you a hundredfold. God will provide for you gold and riches and cars and homes, huge homes and airplanes. And you'll never be sick a day in your life. You see, that's selfish desire. That word lust. In the King James English. Points to the carnal man. The things of the flesh. second thing that Paul points out for Timothy is that his, his audience will practice self-denial. Now, this is not meaning, oh, listen, they're going to be sacrificial. They're going to be giving of themselves. Notice what he says in verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned under fables. They will turn away their ears from the truth. They will deny that self is sinful. They will deny that self needs a Savior. And they will turn unto fables. And you know what? In Baptist circles and Baptist churches all across America, we have been synonymous for presenting those things as, which are extra biblical as being biblical. Think about it. We can't cut that tree down in the churchyard because that tree has been here since the, since the beginning of the church. My kid fell out of that tree and broke his arm. Therefore, that tree is holy. We can't present that color of carpet before the Lord. I had a lady one time told me, said, you know what, I believe every Car every church across America ought to have red carpet because we roll out the red carpet for those kings and princes that come from the world, across the world, and, and royalty. We roll out the red carpet, and we ought to be able to roll out the red carpet for the Lord. Now, while her reasoning, she thought, might have been correct, 
Biblically speaking, she was entirely wrong. It's the heart that God looks at. We should present our hearts as a sacrifice to the Lord. A heart that is repentant. A heart that is truthful. We must not rely on storytelling as a presentation of the gospel. but rather the Logos, the Word of God. Thirdly, Paul says that they'll follow false doctrine. We talked about this. They'll heap to themselves having itching ears. They'll turn their ears from the truth, and they'll should be turned unto fables. But if you go back and look at the first part of verse 3 once again, for the time will come when they will not endure sound Doctrine. When they will not endure sound doctrine. You know, I've had times throughout my years in the ministry, and I've been pastoring churches now for 24 years. Before that, I worked in the church, volunteer on a volunteer basis for about 10 years, almost 10 years. I have led music. I have worked with youth. I have taught Sunday school. And it never ceases to amaze me of the false doctrine that well, good intentioned. Christians, well-meaning and good-intentioned Christians allow to infiltrate the church and take it for the gospel. Well, my grandmother once said, or this is what it means to me. Let me tell you something. The Bible says what it says means what it says, though the application can be different, the Word of God never changes. Don't ever think, well, this is what it means to me, or this is what it says to me. It says what it says, it means what it says. The way you apply it may be differently because each and every one of us are individuals and we have different life experiences, we have different situations. However, God's Word never changes. Don't try to indoctrinate someone with your own personal doctrine if it's not based on the Word of God. Secondly, Paul wants Timothy to understand that he must fulfill his calling. Not only must he know his audience, but he must fulfill his calling. 1 Timothy in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, I charge thee, therefore, King James Version, King James English, uh, New American Standard says, I solemnly charge you. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word, Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Doctrine. First thing, Paul Paul says to Timothy in verse 2, he says, preach the word. That is your ultimate calling as a Christian. Preach the word. Preach the word. Preach. The word. Secondly, he he instructs Timothy that he must do the work. Do the work. Remember, I I 
began this message this morning relating how Paul understood that his death was imminent. But Paul says this, he says, I have fought, notice this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Just prior to that in verse 6, Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. Paul understood that till his dying day, he must preach the word and do the work. Notice what he tells Timothy. But watch thou in all things, verse 5, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Now we would look at the first two phrases, the first two instructions that Paul gives to Timothy. But watch thou, that literally means to be alert, be sober, be vigilant. We find Paul, uh, Peter writing that elsewhere. He says, endure afflictions. Yes, let me tell you something, folks. Being a Christian is not going to be easy. It is not easy. Sharing the Word of God is not easy. You must remember that when you go out to evangelize, when you go out to share the gospel, when you go out to witness to your lost friend or family member or neighbor or co-worker, you may, they may... Say, listen, I don't want to hear it. They're not rejecting you. This is what Jesus says. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. That's what he told his disciples. He told them, he said, Into whatever, whatsoever city will receive you and receive your message, go in. The one that will not receive you, shake the dust off your feet. In other words, go on. Move along. The next opportunity awaits down the road. But he tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. The work of an evangelist means being alert, being watchful, being sober, being vigilant, enduring persecution, affliction, temptation. Yes, I said temptation. Making full proof of thy ministry. In other words, Taking every opportunity that you have. Making every opportunity that you have. An opportunity to share the gospel. Till the die, day that you die. Till the day that you die. Well, preacher, I'm old. Listen, I'm getting old too. I get up every morning. I hurt. I don't feel good. It takes my eyes a little while to get focused. You wait until you get to be my age. Those words make full proof means to carry out fully or to entirely accomplish. Those words make full proof. One Greek word. One Greek word. It means don't quit till you finish. In just plain southern Arkansas English. Thirdly, Paul tells Timothy to be on watch. Be on watch. First part of that verse. Be on watch. You know what you can expect? You can expect afflictions. You can expect rejections. You can expect temptations. As Peter says, the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about and seeketh and seeketh whom he may devour. 
don't think you any different than the Apostle Paul. Do you realize when Paul was writing to the young Timothy that he had already been shipwrecked, beaten, he'd been arrested more than once, and many suspect that at the time that he wrote these two epistles to Timothy that he was in prison and bound for death. He would be beheaded until the day that he died. The Apostle Paul would be encouraging Christians, teaching and preaching to the lost. I would consider that being pretty alert and watchful. Being sober. The third thing that the Apostle Paul encourages Timothy to do is to remember your prize. Notice what he says. Verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. Towards the end of Paul's life, I said this little order, he would present his life as a final offering that had already been full of sacrifices to him. And Paul encourages Timothy to fight the fight. Fight the fight. Fight the fight. Too often we become discouraged. Too often we become overwhelmed. Too often we become burnt out. But Paul tells Timothy, don't let any of those things dictate your actions in the ministry. Fight the fight. He says, I have fought a good, I fought a good fight. Let me tell you what fighting a good fight is. I remember when I was growing up, my dad used to love boxing. And every time a boxing match would come on, we'd have the TV tuned in. And I remember the young Cassius Clay who eventually would change his name to Muhammad Ali. You know, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. And I remember that every fight that I watched Muhammad Ali box in. He didn't quit until the fight was over. Either his opponent was on the floor or he was declared by the umpire or the referee as a victor. I remember watching him on numerous occasions, standing over his opponent, the referee trying to get him out of the way. I am the greatest, he would say. That woke you up, didn't it? Don, you all right? Checking your pulse? Okay. Folks, the fight ain't over till it's over. Fight the fight. By his own example, he instructs Timothy that he must finish the course. I know we have many a race fan out here. The race ain't over till the checkered flag flies. And then and only then, Paul tells Timothy, will you receive the prize? Now, this is, notice this. Paul says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I'm ready to be offered up. I have kept the faith. He says, King James English. We know that Paul was English. Henceforth, I'm just kidding, he wasn't English. Henceforth. In other words, here's the result. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. In other words, Paul says, listen, I've got a reward waiting for me in heaven. But I want you to notice this also. It wouldn't have been enough for Paul to say, listen, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I'm going to get what God has prepared for me. But he looks at the young Timothy and he says, not to me only, Timothy. Not for me only, Timothy. But unto all them also that love his appearing. Instead of concluding this section of his letter with the glorious words telling of his serene courage and his confidence in, in a crowned and immortal life, he adds a gentle reminder to Timothy that he as well as all who really look for the second coming of the Lord might win the same glorious crown of righteousness. My friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can receive that same glorious crown of righteousness. If you'll simply recognize your sin-sick condition, your darkened heart of flesh, stony heart, the scripture calls it in other places, hard heart. If you will confess that sin and repent of that sin, he will cleanse you of that sin. And will grant to you eternal life. Because you're forgiven. And it is forgotten. And there's a treasure awaiting in heaven. That he will lay up in store for you. Christian friend, I want to encourage you this morning. To remember what young Timothy heard from the Apostle Paul. It ain't over till it's over. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Keep on pouring yourself out. for the work of the ministry. God, speak in your heart this morning. How will you respond to his call, to his will for your life? For the person without Christ, God's still calling you. If you've heard his logos, his word. He's still calling you to salvation. Christian friend, don't allow fables, wives' tales, a twisted doctrine to infiltrate the perfect complete message of God to a lost and dying world. Because if you do, it simply becomes hypocrisy for the Christian when you allow something aside or apart or in addition to the Word of God to dictate 
what it means to get to heaven or how to get to heaven. That's false doctrine. That's errancy. That's heresy. There's something you need to get right before the Lord this morning. As our music team comes here in just a moment, listen, you can get it right right there where you're at. If you're ready for salvation, Jesus said, Whosoever will confess me before men, them will I confess before my Father. I want to invite you to step out in the aisle and come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to share with you more about what it means to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to receive forgiveness of your sins, and to know that you have eternal life. Let's stand together this morning. Our Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we thank you for the truth of your word for the weight of your word, for the justice of your word, and for the reward of your word. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, for his sinless character, who died a sinner's death, and shed his perfect blood as a lamb without spot and without blemish, that we might receive forgiveness of our sins, and we might receive eternal life. Lord, we pray this morning simply your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.